above Lake Tal this week, a pillar of smoke and flame and steam. It mushroomed at one time 10,000 feet into the air, a funeral pyre for hundreds of Filipino villagers and fishing families. Most were trapped in their beds when the volcano boiled over after 54 years of smouldering serenity. Today, nine days after the eruption, the exact death roll is still uncertain. First reports of up to 5,000 killed have been discounted, but officials say the final figure will certainly exceed 500. Its setting had become a tourist paradise. For half a century, it had lived down its sinister history, until last week. Tal Island now has become a desert, covered by some nine inches of ash thrown up by the volcano still rumbling three days after its first major explosion. The eruption of the volcano came as a complete surprise. Volcano experts have been over onto this island as shortly as two weeks before the explosion. They predicted that it was completely safe for the 4,000 inhabitants of the island. When the volcano went off at two o'clock in the morning of last Monday, it came with complete surprise. There were no preliminary rumbles. No warning at all was given to the people who lived here. Within three hours, it's estimated that some 500 people had died. Much of the island died with them. Beneath the rain of white-hot ash, trees became petrified. Mud and ash lay ten feet deep in places. Cattle struggled out of it, only to be suffocated by sulphur fumes. Behind them, the human survivors left devastation and memories of the warning that was ignored. The experts had told them it was safe to stay. But when the August danger signals appeared, relatives on the mainland appealed to the people of Tal to leave. They said no. It was time to bring the rice in. They would wait for the first rumble. When it came, it caught them sleeping. And there is no rice to harvest on Tal today. Some villages were engulfed by the blanket of lava and ash. In others, just a house here and there was left standing. Nobody yet knows whether the families who lived here have survived, whether they'll return to build again. With the help of the £45,000 disaster fund set up by President Macapagal of the Philippines. Soon after the disaster, when it was feared that fresh eruptions were imminent, the government stopped people returning and police put the island out of bounds. But some defied the order and the still smoking volcano, seeking to salvage what they could from their shattered homes. Among those who returned, Delphin Barrero. He's a fisherman with a wife and ten children to keep on three pounds ten a week. His home is a mile and a half from the crater, but he's reluctant to leave, even though there's devastation all around. Others were happier to get away from it all, even if some boatman did cash in on the tragedy and demand five pounds a head for the brief voyage to the mainland and safety. Red Cross and other emergency services went swiftly into action as the refugees gathered in schools and rest camps on the mainland. But this week came signs of unrest over the way the operation was being handled. The complaint, no real coordination of the various private and official efforts. It's claimed that thousands not affected by the eruption are getting free supplies, while many deserving cases are getting nothing. While some survivors waited patiently for their rations, others told their stories to Gerald Seymour. Now, what happened to your village when the volcano exploded? Oh, a bit of bread. 
And when I'm shooting very far, very loud, I say to my neighbor, wake up, there's the volcano erupting. Then when morning came, I go, I see my home, my house, my animal, and also my plant. What had happened to your horses and your animals? Oh, my animals all died, and my plant, they were destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, now what happened when you, when you ran away from your house? Was there much mud falling, many rocks? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Like made of graba, mm -hmm. then, then floods, mm -hmm. then that mud, then rain. Mm -hmm. The thunder and lightning were our lungs during that time. Yes. How did you manage to leave the island? Oh, how? I will run and run. Mm -hmm. Were many people killed in your village? Yes, sir. Like in, in our neighbor, neighbor barrio. There are some who are near the river, so they rode in a boat, and by means of two boats they ride. And because of heavy, because they are overloaded, the boat uh, was drawn into the river, so some of them died. Well, what did you do then? How did you escape from your village? Our village was not in the river, so we are all in the valley, so we, means, we come here by means of walking. How far did you have to walk? Maybe 10 kilometers. Away. Do you think the volcano will erupt again? Maybe we cannot tell that because only God can, can determine when it will erupt again. Only God can determine, says Consorcio Mendoza. And until Providence decides the next move in their broken lives, the refugees wait in the schoolhouse at Tau with troops on hand to keep order. The schoolhouse is not only a temporary home, but a makeshift hospital for the injured of all ages. The children who were sleeping when Mount Tal exploded and were snatched to safety by their parents sleep on beside the lake. But these are the lucky ones. Many died in the frantic rush for the boats and many more were injured. Dr. Garcia, what sort of injuries have you had to treat? Well, actually most of them were burns uh, incurred as a result of the uh, throwing out of the hot lava emitting from the volcano. There were also injuries concomitant with the mud rush for safety. Uh, those, are the, those are the sorts of casualties that we have been feeling. How, do, how does a volcano kill people? Well, in this particular case, I think the death was caused by suffocation. Of those who weren't suffocated, some have homes to go back to, others haven't. But one thing they have in common. They lived on a volcano, now they share the vacuum of life in a refugee camp. Because the Filipino volcano experts have proved unable to predict whether or not the Taal volcano will explode again, the authorities have taken the precaution of evacuating some 50,000 people from the shores of Lake Taal. These people at the moment are living in pretty grim conditions. Someday, however, they'll go back to the shores of Lake Taal. They'll go back to the island and again start cultivating the fields underneath the volcano, just as their grandfathers and grandmothers did 54 years ago, after the first volcano on Tal Island erupted. It remains to be seen whether or not this latest volcano will exceed in death toll the performance of the one in 1911. On that occasion, 1,100 people died.